Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Juliana Walker, the Associate Director for Programs and Events at the School of Arts and Sciences. I'm here to welcome you to today's Knowledge by the Slice Lunchtime Talk. Today's talk features Professor Stephanie McCurry. Professor McCurry specializes in 19th century American history with a focus on American South and the Civil War era, and also on the history of women and gender. She will be speaking with us today about her, her book called Confederate Reckoning, Power and Politics in the Civil War South. Following, following the lecture, there will be time for audience question and answer, so enjoy the pizza and please pre pre be prepared to ask questions. I'll turn things over to, now to Professor McCurry. Make sure that's on. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to my lecture. Well, we Americans are in the midst of celebrating an extremely important, but in many ways troubling anniversary. What's that anniversary? Well, 150 years ago, last December, a group of South Carolina politicians did something they had been trying to do for years. They called a convention of the people, as they put it, and they voted themselves out of the union. Within six weeks, uh, I'm sorry, within a, a few weeks, six more deep south states had joined them in their bid for southern independence. And as you know, the country was brought to the brink of war. Uh, theirs was a gamble of massive proportions, to say the least. And as we know, it changed the course of history. In South Carolina, where some politicians had been attempting to organize secession since the 1830s, the secession uh, movement uh, came very rapidly at the end. Those politicians called a convention, voted secession from the union unanimously by lunchtime on the first day of the convention. It was not a difficult decision for them. They ran a new flag up the flagpole. They recalled their senators from, Char from uh, Washington. And by the evening, they had put out an announcement in the Charleston Mercury, the daily paper, declaring themselves out of the Union. And on the same paper that evening, they started reporting Washington news under the heading Foreign News. That is to say, the Union was dissolved, and South Carolina had finally done what it had been trying to do. I recently just finished writing a book about this, the book that Juliana referred to, Confederate Reckoning, Power and Politics in the Civil War South. The book is about the coming of the war, the kind of republic secessionists set out to build, what happened when they did, and the unpredictable, and I think even epic consequences uh, of this event, not just for the Confederacy, or even in fact for the United States, but in the Western world. And it's true that my timing is good in writing a book on the Civil War in the middle of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, but it's mostly just lucky. Uh, historians, you might know, are notoriously slow at doing their work. We follow our own scholarly predilections and trajectories. And let me tell you, I wasn't thinking much about 150th anniversaries when I started this book. It just happened to end at the right moment. But it is true that the anniversary arrives at a moment when public interest in the past, especially in the Revolution and the Civil War, is sharply focused, I think, by developments in our own political life. It isn't just about the past. The past is always part of what is struggled over in the present. That's part of the reason history matters. It's never really gone. It was certainly true of the place where I grew up. I grew up in Catholic Belfast in the 1960s and 70s, where people talked about the past as a way of arguing over the legitimacy of British rule in the present. And it's certainly true of the place I write about, the American South, where the divisions and wounds of slavery in the Civil War continually reassert themselves. There's no place in the United States in the northern memory or southern memory where that war loses its significance uh, for the community of people who see themselves as southerners or northerners. It's hard not to think about the Civil War now when anxiety about the power of the federal government is again on the rise and giving rise in certain quarters to charges about the violation of the original intent of the Constitution, which is an argument secessionists made. Um, when the legitimacy of a democratically elected president is being called into question, uh, when, when many states, most of them southern, uh, talk again about having the right to nullify federal laws, and even about their right to secede from the Union, uh, a constitution, uh, to claim a constitutional right to secede from the Union, 
So let's just say this anniversary, this invitation to remember the Civil War comes at a pretty volatile moment in our own political history. And it's really interesting to think about it in relationship to the last time we had a serious anniversary of the Civil War. You know, 2011 minus 50 makes 1961. Uh, let me just say, don't think I would have to explain too much to say a very different moment for remembering the Civil War than 2011. Um, and in fact, you know, that anniversary came before desegregation and the conversation was entirely constrained around the question of race and slavery in ways that it just simply isn't now. Um, but this is also a moment in which uh, there are a lot of uh, new voices and new causes being attached to the Southern uh, or Confederate, uh, Confederate cause. There's even an organization in the United States that goes by the name CSA, Conservative Society for Action. I mean, you'd have to think twice about using a name for a conservative organization whose short form is CSA, but there it is. And we hear daily of commemorations of secession and Confederate history, secession balls, the re-inauguration of Jefferson Davis in Montgomery, we hear constantly about uh, these kinds of commemorations, which strip away all the problematic aspects of the pro-slavery and white supremacist past to leave what the authors think of as only abstract constitutional rights and the desire for independence. In other words, they want to say, this isn't about slavery. It isn't about white supremacy. It's about the constitutional rights of states. Um, and all of this is happening in the historic term of the first African-American president in the United States. Sometimes you can't help but feel as if the old racial politics are being reanimated. So as we commemorate uh, the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, it seems especially important to me that we go back to the original moment when the Confederacy was launched and take a hard look at what Southerners thought they were doing what secession and Southern independence really portended. And when we do, I think there's one question above all others that we need to ask and answer. Why did they risk it? It's not enough to stop at abstract questions about the constitutionality of secession, as many people would like to do. I think far more troubling is the question of why Southern states insisted on exercising that claimed right. Let's just say they had the right to do it. Why did they want to do it? What was wrong with the original American Republic? What kind of country did Confederates want to build? That's the question I ask in the first part of my book. And the rest of the book takes up the equally compelling story, I think, of the terrible reckoning that came with the war, not just with the Union Army, as we are used to thinking of it, but with their own people, with the Southern people. Um, and this is the reckoning that Southerners' reckless gamble brought on. In writing this book about the Confederacy, I was operating from the assumption that the significance of Southerners' bid for national independence um, was a much bigger story than the one that has usually been told. Uh, if you know anything about the Civil War, you'll know that far, there's far more books written about an interest expressed in the Union than there is in the Confederacy. But of course, you know, the Confederacy started all of this. Um, and I think the history of the Confederacy is a far bigger story than has usually been told. After the Civil War was over, the President Jefferson Davis and other Confederate leaders would always cast secession as a simply a, a wholly constitutional move designed to restore government to what the, fo the founders had intended. Um, they always claimed that this was their intention and in his memoirs in the 1870s, this is what Jefferson Davis said. He said the goal of secession was to protect the rights of sovereign states uh, against the tremendous usurpation of the federal government. Quote, the existence of African servitude was in no way the cause of the conflict, just an incident to it. This was a view that slavery had nothing to do with secession. It was really a constitutional right. Uh, the right, protection of the constitutional rights of the states. This was the view enshrined in his memoirs, in the Lost Cause mythology, and it was taught for years in, in Southern and Northern universities. And far too many historians, even professional ones today, have fallen for this pitch. And in doing so, what I really wanted to say in my book is that they have, been, they have fallen for this and they have lost sight. In falling for it, they have lost sight 
of the true nature of what Confederates were attempting to do at such tremendous cost of blood and treasure. To me, the founding of the Confederate States of America was a signal event in the history of the modern world, because what secession is set out to do was something entirely new in the history of nations. What they, what they wanted to do was build an explicitly pro-slavery government, not one that might protect slavery, but one that was dedicated explicitly to the protection of slavery. They wanted to build an explicitly pro-slavery and anti-democratic nation state, one that was dedicated to the proposition that all men were not created equal. Confederates were fully caught up in the turbulent currents of history in the 19th century, and this was part of a far bigger struggle over uh, the future of slavery, the prospects of democracy, and the powers of nation states. The other thing about uh, Southerners' bid for independence that I think is often misunderstood is that they weren't acting defensively. They acted out of confidence. Uh, they acted out of the confidence that came from the global cotton market, which they dominated. Money makes you proud. Um, they also acted out of confidence, believing that they could launch this pro-slavery republic and sustain it even if it came to war, because they were emboldened by what they saw as the failure of emancipation in other parts of the world. And they believed that countries like England, which had seen their colonies lose productivity and profitability in the aftermath of emancipation, were about to see the error of their ways that it was clear that you could only produce sugar with slave labor, cotton with slave labor, rice with slave labor, and that they would come to see the wisdom of this view if the Confederacy could only uh, uh, establish itself in the international arena. Um, they believed that slavery had been a, a, I'm sorry, that emancipation was a failure and known to be a failure in other parts of the world, in, in Haiti, Jamaica, the northern states, etc. cetera. Um, they were also buoyed by a new science of race, uh, convinced that the American vision of the people had been terribly betrayed. Uh, they sought the kind of future for human slavery and conservative Republican government that was no longer possible within the original Union. So the Confederacy was a huge gamble. And let's be clear, it was a gamble on the future of slavery. Confederates would later deny it, but in time and place, the architects of secession were brutally candid about their motives. You only have to look at the record in time and place, not the 1870s and the 1880s when they were back to making uh, cover stories for themselves, but in 1860 and 61 when they went to the people and made the case for secession, they were extremely candid. Uh, so let me mention a few things. Uh, historians always deal in the realm of evidence, of course. Um, first of all, many southern states, all of them in fact, that seceded wrote justifications for their secession as, Jefferson, as Thomas Jefferson had when the United, when the colonies seceded, uh, not seceded, uh, rebelled against England in the 1770s. In theirs called, quote, the Declaration of Immediate Causes, the state of Mississippi said bluntly that, quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, with a northern majority advocating Negro equality, we have no choice but to submit to the loss of our property worth $4 billion or secede from the Union. It's kind of what you'd call a bottom line argument. Far from obscuring their reasons, they trumpeted them to the world, certain that others would share their view of emancipation uh, as a failure. And in fact, in March 1861, the vice president of the Confederacy, this tiny little person, Alexander Stevens, little Alex they called him, probably the worst vice president in the history of any country in the world. Um, he was still on board with the Confederate. He was actually a unionist. He had voted against secession in Georgia, but after it was pushed through, he temporarily got on board. He, he turned out to be the biggest enemy, uh, sort of what you call it, uh, opposition to uh, President Jefferson Davis, but for a brief moment in early 1861, he was very much on board, and he was very dedicated to trying to bring the border states, Virginia especially, into the Confederacy and not leave them in the Union. And in March of 1861, he tried to recruit the border states to join the Confederacy and offered a political manifesto for the slaveholders' new republic. And this is what he said. It's a speech called the, Co the Cornerstone Speech. He said, the original American Republic, quote, rested upon the assumption of the equality of the races. 
But our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests, upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery is his natural condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based on this great truth. It's a horrifyingly scary proposition because, in fact, the racial science was nowhere near its apex. It was just starting to get going. So could you imagine if the Confederacy had managed somehow to bargain a, a, some kind of you know, negotiated solution, hold on for a few years. Scientific racism was on the rise. In that sense, Stevens was right. This was a new idea, and they were harnessing it to nationalism, but pro-slavery nationalism, which is why I think the Confederate experiment is so important. I mean, it's crucial that they got beaten, is what I'm trying to say. At the time, uh, nobody uh, tried to obscure the fact that slavery was the cause of secession. Uh, they had the right to defend their property in slaves against a government and its new black Republican president, as they called Lincoln, pledged to eradicate it. It was clear what the argument was. And when southern states seceded, they wrote themselves a pro-slavery constitution for that new pro-slavery government. And it is often said, and you will hear this all the time now, uh, that the Confederate Constitution really wasn't much different or any different, that it was a copy of the US one. I actually wrote an article for the New York Times uh, last year proving this was not the truth, true, where you could, um, it has little hyperlinks where you can click on and find out what they changed. But they made a number of changes. They did use the US Constitution as their model. Um, but they made a number of changes that critically changed the meaning of the document. First of all, you, as you might recall, the uh, original American Constitution never uses the word slaves or slavery. It uses terms like other persons, persons held to servitude and labor. But the Confederate Constitution got rid of all of the euphemisms and brazenly used the term slaves and slavery, which the original was too embarrassed to do. And it explicitly bound the Congress and the territorial governments of the new Confederate States of America to recognize and protect, quote, the institution of Negro slavery. In fact, they wrote an entirely new clause and added it to the Constitution, which put it forever beyond the power of their new federal government to ever abolish slavery. In other words, they tied their own hands, which by the end of the war, they would regret, or at least Jefferson Davis regret. The law said, no law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall ever be passed. So we're in, and we're in for good. They also moved to limit democracy by explicitly confining the right to vote permanently to white men. This is why I call it an anti-democratic constitution as well as a pro-slavery one. And interestingly, despite the recognition that each of the states were sovereign, uh, they did not, in fact, confer the right to secede on their own constituent states. That is to say, they claimed they had a right to constitutionally secede, but when they made a new union, they didn't let those states have a constitutional right to secede, which I think confirms Lincoln's point that no government ever provides for its own dissolution. So you can see that far from adopting the original form of the American government and principles that the Declaration and Constitution were based on, they in fact had created something that had never existed before, a government explicitly pledged to the enslavement of people of African descent into perpetuity and the restriction of the right to vote to white men. This was not the original republic restored, no matter what anybody tries to tell you. This was something else entirely. This was a country that defended slavery, rejected democracy, and scorned the Declaration of Independence. It rejected most of the principles Americans claim to value most highly. Secession, as I said, was the South's big gamble. They could have played a wait and see game, right? Lincoln was not moving against slavery immediately. It would have taken a long time for this to play out. Uh, but for those mostly deep South Southerners who orchestrated secession in 1860 and 61, the election of Abraham Lincoln was actually a, a presented a risky but desperately sought opportunity to bring the crisis of slavery to a head. And with secession, they went all in. Well, it didn't take long for war, and with war came the reckoning. For drama and justice, I think, little matches the reckoning to which the Confederate Republic was subjected. Um, 
To me, the Confederacy is not just a story of military defeat. That's certainly a story we know. But it is far more powerfully a story of political failure. Because one thing that has hardly been noticed about the Confederacy is that it was based on a very slim foundation of democratic consent. The Confederate politicians claimed that they based this government on the consent of the people, OK? That was the, how it, it claimed to be a legitimate government. But you have to understand what the consent of the people meant uh, in, the, in the American South. It's the insufficient, it's the sort of highly restricted and I think insufficiently scrutinized idea of the people that's particular to racial democracies in the 19th century and particularly to those of slave states. In other words, what does it really mean to get the consent of the people? Well, maybe one and a half million Southerners out of the population of 10 million, that is to say the number of white male voters, one and a half million out of 10 million, had ever been consulted about the wisdom of secession and war. So let's not make any mistake. When we talk about the consent of the people, it's that subset of the people that have the vote. Um, and they're building a republic. And believe me, it wasn't easy to get ordinary white farmers to support this. There was a lot of interesting in politics that went into this. Um, but if it took only one and a half million to create this republic, it would have taken all 10 million to defend it in war. And that, I think, is the untold part of the story. And it's the, part of, it's the story that I wanted to tell. Because when the war came, the Confederate national project was tested from within as well as from without. Because in terms of the practicality and justice of its own national ambitions, the Confederacy had to pass the test. It was subject to the test, to the judgment of its own people, even as it, as it attempted to survive the military test it faced from the Union Army. In other words, it involved a, mil a, a political as well as military trial. And that many of the people who tested it were from the vast ranks of the politically dispossessed in the Confederacy, poor white rural women and enslaved men and women. This, I think, shows the profound poverty of the founders' original vision of the people. And it also shows the particular nature of the reckoning that came to the slaveholders' new republic when the war started. At one level, the problem was pretty obvious. The Confederacy had an economy and a population that was a fraction the size of its enemy. The North had 10 times the South's manufacturing capacity, and the South's population of 10 million was dwarfed by the Union's 22 million. But even that understates the problem, because remember, if the South has 10 million people, 4 million of them are enslaved which means that 40% of the adult male population is unavailable for military service. So in a military sense, you're not comparing a population of 22 million and 10 million. You're comparing a population of 22 million and 6 million. And this has incredible structural consequences in the Confederacy. Quickly became clear what such imbalances meant. The South would have to exert unprecedented and insupportable demands on its population and build up a powerful central state to do what its private sector could not. Uh, the Union financed the war through private money, and it, it, it uh, provided uh, the materiel of war by putting out contracts into the private marketplace. But how do you do that in an agricultural society? So they have to build these capacities from scratch, and they have to use government money to do it. So the Confederacy is forced to take measures that are drastic, even by the standards of mobilization that became true in the North. The new powers that this, remember this is a states' rights government that then has to act as the most powerful central government in American history. One political scientist has said the United States did not have a government this big until the New Deal. So this is one of the profound ironies of the Confederacy. The new powers that the federal government claimed challenged slaveholders' usual paramount authority over their slaves, and it posed tests of nationalism. Many of them failed. But for slaves and white women, who had normally been left under the uh, private authority of their husbands and masters, the, the Civil War was more than a test of political commitments. It was a profoundly transformative event. It pulled them out of the shelter of the household, or the family, and into the necessity of engagement in public life. For them, the Confederate War was a moment when time itself opened up, and they stepped into the making of history. By 1862, the process of desperate innovation in the Confederacy was already well advanced. 
and the Davis administration was driven to adopt the first conscription act in American history. Remember this, one year into the war, they had to, they had to go to conscription. They couldn't get enough men anymore uh, voluntarily. And they were forced to mobilize a far higher proportion of white men than the Union ever had to do. When all was said and done, the Confederacy mobilized and enlisted in the Army a staggering 75 to 85 percent of adult uh, white men, of military age white men. 75 to 85 percent. Do you know what a community looks like when 85 percent of white men are gone? And we're talking about an agricultural community. Um, and the military age started out as 18 to 35 and ended up 15 to 55. So they're robbing the cradle and the grave. And they're also forced to adopt a variety of labor and tax policies that also bite back on them. To say that the government tested the limits of popular support for war is an understatement. Um, it took a lot of coercion to get 85% of men into the army. And when combined with the uh, ex exceptions that the government is forced to make for slaveholders, from military service, including an exemption of one white man for every 20 Negroes owned, conscription quickly raised cries of rich man's war, poor man's fight. Uh, in fact, um, every time you conscript, it it's, uh, becomes criminal to resist conscription, and uh, the government then has to use part of the army to go out and round up the people who are resisting conscription, and the problem of desertion was an enormous problem in the Confederacy, especially in uh, uh, places like North Carolina. Um, so they're looking, they're basically hunting uh, men who have escaped um, military service, and they're hunting them in a, in, a, in a society where white men think only slaves get hunted by posses of armed men. So this is a really interesting uh, p political moment. Um, so this, this conscription quickly raises cries of rich man's war, poor man's fight. But it quickly became the women's fight as well. Because even as the Confederate government attempted to get every white man into the army, uh, they faced a daunting political challenge from the mass of white Southern women and their new collective identity as soldiers' wives. Um, this is something that I don't have time to go into, but just really I, fi I find completely interesting which is that the Union and the Confederate government start the war with absolutely no concern about the loyalty of women. They don't think women matter if they're loyal or if they're treasonous. Uh, but when the Union army invades the South and starts to occupy places like Nashville, New Orleans, Winchester, Virginia, they start to find these Confederate women acting openly against them, running prisoner of war networks, spy networks, intelligence networks, uh, stack, stockpiling guns in their in their uh, attics, all kinds of things. And in New Orleans, it became such a threat to civil uh, peace that the uh, Union officer who was occupying the city wrote an edict that said that women who did not take an oath of allegiance back to the Union, to return to their loyalty to the Union, would have to leave the city and go into Confederate territory. And this is an image from um, Harper's Weekly of all these bejeweled and becrinolined Southern women traipsing down to the provost marshal's office, uh, hoping that they won't have to take the oath of allegiance if they just find the right guy, talk to the right man in the right way. And they're absolutely horrified when they find out that they're not going to be let off of this. And they say things like, this is ridiculous treating us like we are men. So they want to act politically, but they want to use their gender as a kind of disguise. What, me do that? No, that's not politics. What, treason? No. But this whole recognition that women pose a problem of treason is, I think, another way in which women's politics becomes recognized and important in the context of the war in which it isn't before. But inside the South, the real challenge comes from this massive class of women who are created by the conscription of the men, soldiers' wives. After all, the South is an agrarian society, and whole regions of it are populated by yeoman and poor white families. There had never been any expectation that women could make subsistence on those farms without the labor of their husbands and sons. And as it turns out, they couldn't. And they start to starve. And by 1863, there is a food crisis in the Confederacy that reaches starvation proportions, and it dominates the internal correspondence of the War Department. Uh, they have to find a solution. Um, it turns into a political crisis because women mobilized to force the government to fulfill its promises to protect and support them. 
And this politics of subsistence, as I call it, and the new political class of soldiers' wives who make it is one entirely unanticipated element of reckoning that the war had brought. And I tell the story in my book about these women and the way they deluged federal officials uh, with warnings about the consequences of a military policy geared towards the interest, as they always put it, of the big men. By, that's what they mean by the planters. And they threatened all kinds of actions if they were not satisfied. They increasingly spoke in a collective voice, we soldiers' wives. And they didn't just demand relief, you know, like send my son home, but justice for the Confederate poor as a whole. And all this evidence is in the archives where historians have missed it for generations. But nobody missed what happened next, because in the spring of 1863, Soldiers' wives took direct action in a wave of spectacular food riots that swept the Confederacy from Mobile to Richmond. Mobs of women, numbering from a dozen to more than 300, and armed with navy, uh, sorry, uh, armed with navy revolvers, Bowie knives, and hatchets, carried out at least 12 violent attacks on stores, government warehouses, army convoys, granaries, salt works. And these attacks occurred in broad daylight, and they were all perpetrated in the space of one month between the middle of uh, March and the middle of April 1863. It's a starving time in rural communities uh, this spring. Conspiracy theories abounded when this wave of riots hit the Confederacy. This must be the work of men, Yankee men, causing trouble within the Confederacy. In most cases, we don't know how the riots were organized, but in Richmond, the biggest we do, and as it turns out, it was not the work of men, but of one Mary Jackson, soldier's mother, farm wife, and hucksterer in meat at the public market. She had tried to solve her problems through appeals to the Secretary of War. One of the, hers was only one of the thousands of angry, threatening letters that landed on the Secretary of War's desk during the war. Uh, these riots, historians have never understood them, because they just seem to come out of nowhere, but they actually have a really deep backstory. I think they are the most dramatic manifestations of the new political realities at work in these rural and urban communities, what I call this soldier's wives politics of subsistence. It's true that most women never cross the line to direct, to direct action, but when Mary Jackson got no satisfaction, she recruited 300 women, uh, town and country women, to a meeting at the Belvedere Baptist Church in Richmond, she got up into the pulpit, itself a sin, uh, to rally her troops. She told them to gather the next day at the entrance to Capitol Square to leave their children at home, a detail I love, and to come armed. It was truly a Confederate spring of soldiers' wives' disconsent, discontent. And these women made themselves count because the wave of food riots that hit the Confederacy had a measurable impact on war policy. It forced revisions of tax policy and conscription policy, but most importantly, it forced the development of a massive welfare program by the states that in allocating scarce funds and foods, foodstuffs to the relief of women and children dwarfed anything undertaken uh, by uh, governments in the North. And this is one piece of evidence that confirms what I'm saying. By 1864, the food supply Confederacy was completely controlled by the army. Every surplus uh, food, item of food went to them. They literally went to people's barns and, and farms and took 10% uh, out of their barn. Um, and you could not sell food on an open market. You had to sell it to the army. But by 1863 and 1864, the army was being forced to give food back to the counties, to the county uh, commissioner for the poor for distribution to soldiers, wives, and children. So this is evidence of what was forced on the government by the women who they couldn't, uh, they really just couldn't take the risk that they would become even more in opposition to the government. And so they had to uh, build this massive welfare um, uh, policy. In the heart of Confederate national territory, the mass of white Southern women had emerged as formidable adversaries of the government in their long struggle over the justice of its military policies. By insisting that the government live up to its promises to protect them, them these poor white women who had never participated in politics before stepped decisively into the making of history. And if this new political assertiveness of women didn't bring down the Confederacy, and I'm not arguing that it did, 
It did represent a powerful challenge to the original Confederate vision of the people and the republic, and it showed the limits of their pro-slavery and anti-democratic nationalism. Any government that took their men was going to have to answer to them. Well, I know we don't have a lot of time left, so let me talk quickly about the last part of my book, because the reckoning with slaves' politics was even more direct and consequential than that with the women. At the birth of the American Republic, Thomas Jefferson had warned that slavery destroys slaves' love of country, that it makes them allies of any foreign power that will countenance their emancipation. This makes sense, right? That it nurtures traitors at the American breast. Well, what's he thinking about? He's thinking about Lord Dunmore and the American Revolution. Uh, but the same thing happened in the Civil War. And secessionists seemed heedless of the dangers. They gave no thought to what slaves would do. They discounted entirely the matter of slaves' allegiance. It's one of the most stunning things I learned in all of this many years of research, is how these politicians and the people who supported them were willing to think about secession without talking about ever about what the slaves would do if there was a war. It's a kind of blinder mentality that is just impossible for modern people to understand. The only people who acknowledged that there might be problems were unionists who were opposed to secession and war. What they said was, there's going to be a war. And once in a while they would say, and slaves will not be quiescent when it starts. We will have serious problems. But secessionists themselves did not. Uh, but it quickly became clear that slaves were going to move decisively to grasp the opening that history offered in what is, after all, their long war against the slaveholders. In the Civil War, slaves made their loyalty and allegiance count and created a significant problem of treason in the Confederacy. The problem was evident first to masters on plantations, who as early as January 1861 found evidence of sedition, as well as powder and guns in slave quarters, insurrectionary plots and networks of slave communication providing valuable intelligence to the enemy. But slaves' activities had crucial consequences not just for their owners, but it be quickly became clear for the Confederate government and military as well. Confederates had begun the war. Uh, this is another thing that's just stunning to modern people. Confederates began the war boasting that slaves would be an element of strength. They would say things like, well, it doesn't matter if the Union have more people than us. We have slavery, so all of our white men can go into the military and we'll use the slaves for everything else, like military labor. This is a policy called impressment, where they, where they ask owners to voluntarily send their slaves to work on military fortifications. Well, let's just say the voluntary program didn't work. At $1,000 a head and heavily mortgaged, how many people were going to send openly rebellious property to army camps on the coast, which are by definition in walking distance of Union operations. So let's just say this was a tough sell, and this business about slavery as an element of strength quickly became an empty boast. Because when they demanded the labor of male slaves to support the war, the, the, this policy called impressment, the government and military found itself in a losing conflict with slaveholders. Um, slaveholders thought the army was there to protect slave property, the value of slave property, from running to the enemy. As one pol uh, southern slaveholder said, is not the protection of property one of the duties of an army in the field? So they saw the army as a giant slave patrol that, whose job was to prevent their slaves running to the enemy. Um, <clears throat> Taken as a class, slaveholders proved spectacularly unwilling to sacrifice property for nation. Uh, as one Mobile, Alabama uh, newspaper put it, quote, the planter is more ready to contribute his sons than his slaves to the war. And perhaps there's nothing surprising about that in a country founded explicitly for the protection of property and slaves. After all, this is what they thought their government was there for. So the government wants to use uh, slave property to wage the war and the owners want to use the government to protect slave property from the war. So there's a fundamental contradiction here. Planters colluded with their slaves in thwarting impressment. They take oaths of allegiance in occupied territory to get their property back. And they attack military commanders who don't make a priority of protecting slavery in making military decisions. But if slaveholders were a weak link in the Confederacy, even bigger resistance came from the slaves themselves. 
Enslaved men resisted impressment for a variety of very good reasons. It forced a separation from their families, it withdrew their labor from their support, and it exposed them to significant threats of disease and violence at the hands of white military men. But the military men on these works knew that slaves resisted for po political reasons too. One engineer in charge of the works in Northern Virginia said slaves, quote, refuse to do labor that will thwart the Federals who they look upon as fighting for their freedom, echoes of Jefferson here, in seizing every chance to run away to the enemy, uh, uh, run away from the works, often straight to the enemy, the property insisted on acting as persons, persons who saw the war as a critical moment in their own political history and long war against slavery and slaveholders. So this mix of problems creates intractable challenges for military commanders. They know that slaves pose a danger to their military operations, but after all, they can't pursue them as other persons caught providing aid and comfort to the enemy. That is to say, people who are guilty of treason. It's really revealing, I think, that the best description of slaves' anti-Confederate activities comes from military men who had to pay the price of those treasonous activities uh, in the threats to their own military operations. Well, the dilemma came to a head very early on uh, in March 1862 in Pensacola Harbor when a Confederate officer, heedless of the consequences, initiates a court-martial of seven slave men. I mean, it's too good to be true. A court-martial of slaves, people who are property, who have no standing at all in relationship to the government. The charges, quote, attempt to violate the 57th article of war, holding correspondence with and giving intelligence to the, to the enemy. Who ever heard of a Negro slave being arraigned before a court martial for a violation of the Articles of War, the incredulous master railed? And who indeed? After all, think about the definition of treason. What is treason? Treason is uh, acting to overthrow or impair the well-being of a government to which you owe allegiance. Okay, the last phrase is crucial. You can't be treasonous to somebody else's government. You can only be treasonous to your own, right? So what question does this raise? Profound questions about, in charging slaves with treason, this military officer inadvertently raised profound questions about slaves' political status and membership in the polity. Do slaves owe allegiance to the state? Can they be traitors? Are they subject to military law? Well, this dilemma goes all the way up the chain of command to the Office of the Secretary of War. They ask the Attorney General to write a decision, which he manages not to do. Let's just say it's never resolved, I think because it can't be resolved. Um, some things you just have to fudge because a legal decision, what's the legal decision going to be? That they aren't capable of treason? That, they are, that their legal status is property? Anyway, this is a big problem. Confederate commanders have to be able to recognize slaves as traitors, if only to contain the damage they pose to the military. But how can they do that? Um, how can they adopt that as an official military policy without profound damage to the status of slaves as property, whose only allegiance is to their masters? In other words, if slaves are traitors, clearly they are no longer just slaves. And something different has happened to the pro-slavery nation. But the kinds of transformation the Pensacola officer acknowledged were irreversible, and they had profound ramifications in the Confederacy, as the need to harness slaves' labor uh, to the military relentlessly pressed a recognition of the only terms on which slaves were willing to offer it. We're running out of time, so let me just tell you quickly what happened, is that against all odds, the Confederacy is forced to consider the arming of slaves themselves. We know that the Union government is forced to do this, right? Lincoln says it's, he does it as, a, 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 as commander in chief and as a military necessity. But what is not often understood is that the Confederacy was forced to the same policy, that is to say enlistment policy, not emancipation policy. It's a familiar part of the narrative of the Union Civil War, but less well known as how four million slaves' resistance to the pro-slavery agenda of the Confederate government 
pushes it down its own reluctant path to slave enlistment. The most radical plan comes out in December 1863 from a guy uh, in the Army of Tennessee, uh, an army that has been beaten repeatedly from the top of the Cumberland Valley all the way down to uh, northern Georgia. Remember, the Army of Tennessee is the one in the Mississippi Valley, and they lose much. The Confederacy is do doing very well in Virginia, but not doing very well in the West. So the radical proposals are coming out of the West. And what he says is, um, uh, he, he says, um, uh, we are fighting a war on two fronts. We have the Union in front and the slaves in the rear. And we have to win their loyalty to the cause. It's kind of a tall order for a pro-slavery government. And he says, the only way we will be able to do that, this is to recognize what they want out of this war, which is freedom. And he says, we must bind him, the male slave, to our cause by no doubtful bonds and the only bond sufficient is the hope of freedom, it would be preposterous to expect him to fight against it with any degree of enthusiasm. When we make soldiers of them, we must make free men of them beyond all question. And so with the failure of impressment, the Confederate government is forced to consider, this is a picture of slaves <coughs> running away from their masters and crossing the uh, river in Virginia to join the Union Army. One Union officer called it the oncoming of cities the numbers were so large. There's estimates that as many as 500,000 slaves made it to Union lines uh, during the Civil War. This is a picture, a northern cartoon, of the idea that Confederates would be able to get uh, slave men to fight for them. But by a long, it seems absurd, but by a long circuitous route, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee are eventually forced to contend uh, with the humanity and politics of the slaves whose status as property they had seceded to secure. By 1864 and 65, officials in the highest reaches of the Confederate government were forced to win slaves over to their cause uh, because they so desperately needed their military service. But what is important to remember, because this is a, an enormous fuss on the internet and everywhere else, is the idea that uh, the Confederacy enlisted, was willing to enlist slave men in its army is often used as proof that the cause of the Confederacy was national independence, not slavery. And the argument is often made that arming slaves proves that they were willing to sacrifice slavery for independence. But the details really matter here, because in March of 1865, and it took till March, the Congress finally did write a law allowing the use of black men, slave and free, in the Confederate Army. They did do that under incredible duress, March of 1865. Davis had been trying to get this law since December 1864. But when they wrote it, they refused to write an Emancipation Clause. In fact, they said, nothing in this act authorizes a change in the relation which the said slaves bear towards their owners. In other words, the Congress proposed to enlist still enslaved men as soldiers in the Confederate Army. So if you ever hear this idea of Confederate emancipation, it's wrong. What they wanted was enlistment, Confederate enlistment. Emancipation was what some people thought they'd have to give to get enlistment, but the Congress would not do it. The War Department wrote orders saying that only slave men with free papers would be allowed to serve in the Army, and that's because Robert E. Lee did not want slave men. What are you going to do with people who are coerced to fight? I mean, from a military point of view, this makes zero sense. So initially, he says he will only take them if they are free and come, quote, by their own consent. The idea of slaves being able to give consent is the same as the idea of slaves being capable of treason. If they are able to give consent, if they are capable of free will, they are not property. Right? And remember what I told you about the Confederate Constitution. They had written an act at the beginning saying that the federal government could not abolish slavery. This is the point at which they start to uh, regret that decision. Because what it means is that Jefferson Davis has to go to the individual states and beg the governors to do something. And the only one who'll play ball is the governor of Virginia. And even he won't write an, can't get his legislature to write an emancipation clause. So in the end, two companies of black soldiers are raised and drilled on the streets of Richmond um, and sent to serve in the trenches in front of Petersburg days before the end. 
but there's nothing in the historical record by which I could reconstruct their legal status. I don't know if they were there with free papers or not. In the last desperate days of the Civil War, those two companies of soldiers uh, were raised, but the Confederate Congress and the Virginia legislature refused to the bitter end to condone the emancipation of any slave men who served. The story of arming slaves and how Confederates arrived at that juncture is surely the most dramatic kind of reckoning they had brought on themselves by war, and it's also one potent measure of the political incoherence their national project had come to by the end of the war. Davis and his cabinet had been forced to do the unthinkable, um, undermine owners' paramount claim to their slaves, and move to enlist slave men to save the slaveholders' republic. That episode does not imply that Confederates chose independence over slavery as so many people continue to insist. It is rather, I think, a profound indication of the structural problems they had faced as a slave regime at war. And I think most importantly, it is the ultimate measure of what slaves wrought in Confederate political life. The Confederacy was transformed by war, and the Confederate political project was undone by the very people who had been taken for ciphers in it. Military defeat was coupled with political failure. Given the pro-slavery and anti-democratic aspirations of the Confederacy, I think there was a certain justice in that. By April 1865, the Confederacy was in ruins, a nation founded in a risky bid to render slavery and the power of American slaveholders permanent had failed spectacularly, bringing down the most powerful slave regime in the Western world. To say it changed the course of history is not to say too much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. They certainly didn't, white Southern women certainly didn't use it to make demands for women's rights because there's no women's rights movement in the South until the 1880s. There's a black women's rights movement in the South, but there's not a white women's right mo rights movement. And when it comes, it comes on an explicitly segregationist basis, right? So there's no direct line that can be drawn there. This isn't a liberal moving sidewalk of get politicized claim rights. In fact, one of the things I'm arguing in the book is that what's so striking about the way they mobilize is that they don't talk about rights at all. They don't feel empowered as citizens. They don't say, you know, I'm a citizen, you need to. But nobody treated women as citizens uh, in the 19th century. Um, and they don't mobilize um, uh, in the name of feminism, of women's rights. It's completely outside their orbit. There is no women's rights movement in the South before the Civil War. So the question really is unanswerable until somebody does the research. I think the preoccupation with uh, women's women's suffrage and the assumption that all politics leads to women's suffrage is erroneous. And the other place where historians have looked in the aftermath of the Civil War is the lost cause. And they know that elite white Southern women are very prominent in the defense of the Confederacy in textbooks and public culture and commemoration. But the women I'm talking about, they have nothing to do with that. We have no idea what these women did after the war. If it was me and I was doing the research, I would look at public policy. I think the obvious place to look for them pressuring government officials is where it was during the war, welfare, aid to widows and orphans. What do people need? These are women who are forced into political life not by choice, but by necessity. And I know they don't stay there in the same way because the correspondence to, go, uh, to politicians is zero in 1860, starts to rise. It's an enormous by 63 and 64, starts to drop. And I know by 66 and 67, it's way down again. So I think that the lasting differences, my emphasis was far more on process, politicization as process. These women learned how to make demands. They learned the how to work the bureaucracy. They, um, they learned how to strategize. They were extremely pragmatic and uh, strategic. I don't think that ever goes away. Um, they learned how to make politicians accountable to them and to have them removed, all these uh, officers for the poor, for example, who had military exemptions to serve them. If they didn't get do a good job, the women wrote the governor and said, 
this guy's not doing his job, get rid of him, send him into the army. I mean, they got really good at hardball politics. And I don't think that goes away. But where it goes, that's a research project. It's not easily, the, this, the part that I discovered wasn't known either. So I think we have to go into the political records of legislative debates and other kinds of things in the aftermath of the war, especially around policy questions. These governments are bankrupt, so they don't have much money to spend, but they do have to feed the poor and look after widows and orphans. So I, that would be my guess, but it's just a guess. Any other questions? Yes. You talked about like scientific racism, and isn't that a little anachronistic because of racial hygiene theory and social Darwinism just occurred in the late 19th century? No, absolutely. And, in terms, there, there were also like riots in the north, in a, like an anti-draft riot in New York City, and wealthy people in the north also fought out. Um, also. Well, those are separate questions, right? The scientific racism and then yeah, the opposition I, 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 to yeah. confederate to government pol military policy. Yeah, I just want to bring up those well, um, there's n there's no uh, th you're absolutely right in the sense of social Darwinism, but there is a scientific racism before the Civil War. Actually, it originates here at Penn. Samuel Morton's skull studies. The skulls are in the museum. Um, they were studies to prove a hierarchy of racial intelligence that I think were done in the 1840s. I have a student who's writing a paper on this right now. So when Alexander Stevens talks about a new science of race, he is catching something that's on the upswing. It's not on the basis of Darwinian science. It's not on an evolutionary science basis, but it is on the basis of a kind of set of scientific claims about the origins of the species and the separate origins of the species and the hierarchical intelligence of species of human beings for which there are there is so-called scientific evidence by 1860. There's a pro-slavery uh, use of that, but there's a far more powerful um, uh, just use of that in the North to justify various kinds of social discrimination against African Americans who are free. So uh, there is scientific racism, but it's not Darwinian. Um, and the other thing that you're raising about the North. Well, I, it, it's absolutely true. There is opposition to the draft in, in the Union, as in the Confederacy. Um, but I'm not really exactly sure what you're, you, what you're. But you're just sort of demonizing the South over those things. Well, I so wasn't trying to. The South, then also I didn't say that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, what I was saying was, in the South, it had consequences for military policy. I, if I was treating the subject in the North, I would be talking about the draft riots in the North. But I think that um, the, the uh, failure of the Confederate political project actually has far more to do with people who are not enfranchised and not enlisted in the army than those who are. I mean, I was just simply making the point that the level of mobilization that the Confederacy has to attempt, 75 to 85% compared to 50% in the Union, is so overwhelmingly heavy in its burden it puts on the population that it has this kind of domino effect of taking so many men out of the community that uh, women can't even um, make a living or make subsistence. This is not true in the North, because fewer men are taken out, because the North is not overwhelmingly agricultural in the same way, because there's more money to provide um, uh, aid, uh, more machinery to replace men. It just has a, different, it has a different political effect in the North. And in fact, draft riots in the North have a different cause, right, than in the South. It's immigrant opposition to a draft that enlists white men, but not black men. That's it. Thank you very much.